Welcome to Old Iron Machine Works. This video will be Old Iron Tidbits number two, and it'll be the last video of 2021. Here I'll start by showing uh, the last purchases I got at the local scrapyard. And to keep the video down a little bit, it was way too long, so I already uh, cut a lot of it out. So I'm only going to show the items that I'm actually using in this video. And this come along, um, I used actually in assisting getting the big monarch lathe uh, into the shop. Now, without a doubt, this is the coolest purchase that I got from this uh, load at the scrapyard. And what it is is a tug bar. And as soon as I seen it, I knew right away um, that it could be very handy. And basically what it is is it's almost like a motorized Johnson bar. And um, when I seen it, I talked price and I thought, okay, you know, he did $175 for it. And I thought it was well worth the risk. If I got to scrap it out, fine. If it works and if I can make something out of it, it'll be super handy. Well, as you can see here, it's definitely sat in uh, mud or something for an awful long time and got froze solid. And I actually had to heat it up a couple times before I could finally uh, drive the pin out. Uh, but sometimes with these kind of jobs, uh, you got to be patient. Here you can see the rear wheels are lock solid. So at some point when I restore this, I'll just cut those wheels off. I don't want to risk cracking or breaking that back aluminum housing. So sometimes, you know, just being patient really goes a long ways. Here I'm just running a ream down the hole just to clean it up. Um, best way to clean up the hole but yet still keep a nice nice fit uh, with the pin. But I do want to point out too before I went to all this trouble I did hook up power to the motor and all that seemed to work fine. I had a little bit of problems with the with the switch. Um, contact points were kind of arced up but I was able to uh, kind of clean them up you know, for now and make them, you know, where I could at least uh, use it to see how it's going to work out. Well, in this video, this is one of the first things that I'm moving out of the way. And this cabinet is packed solid with all my stainless steel, brass, copper, chrome-plated brass. Uh, quite heavy. Uh, trying to maneuver it around, you know, by hand is pretty difficult. And as you can see with the tug bar, it, it, yeah, it didn't even know it was hooked to it. Here, I'm moving out a 1947 Regal LeBlanc 19-inch lathe I've had for probably almost 35 years. I haven't used it in years, and I was talking about getting rid of it, and my daughter and Jack showed interest in it, that, you know, they both would like to be able to play around with it and start learning a little machining. Um, so I gave it to them. I'd rather give it to my kids um, than sell it. And here you can see where the tug bar um, thing weighs 3,000 pounds and really handled it without any problem at all. Now when I say my kids, um, I should clarify, Jack uh, has been seeing my daughter for oh nine ten years now so he is definitely uh, i consider him uh, one of my own just like my own kids all right here we're getting ready to load up the the regal leblon on the trailer to take out the uh, jack's family property just outside of town and on these old regal leblons are very top heavy 
And generally what I want to do is I like to lift it from the bed itself. And then you'll see the strap going over to the headstock. Basically what that strap is doing is keeping the thing from wanting to tip either forward or back uh, because they are so top heavy. I've always really enjoyed this old Regal LeBlanc. Uh, at the time, I also had a Monster Monarch that was like a 22-inch swing Monarch, 10,000-pound lathe. Probably same vintage, 40s vintage. And I sold it probably 20-something years ago because I just like the controls and everything on this Regal, but they are lightweight. This one here is a 19-inch swing. I uh, forgot the centers pretty good sized centers and it weighs 3,000 pounds. The 9,000 pound Monarch that you'll see me bringing into the shop in its place has less swing and less center to center capacity. But that's about it. It dwarfs it and you know the gears, the headstock, everything else. So the Regals are a little on the light side but I've always enjoyed them. You know if you're not hogging a lot of material off. And here it's just showing where our Jack's out on the skid steer. And just outside of town, we're on his family property, and they got an old shop out there where they do uh, anything ranch related that they needed to work on. And so we just thought that'd be a perfect place. You know, they already got three phase and everything out there. And, you know, so we took it out there, and uh, I'm just going to show getting it into the shop, and then from there, you know, Jack got it all in position and wired up and uh, actually up and running. Now here's a do-all grinder that I have a video on and this I got through Flea Market Dave which is a good close friend of of Chuck over there at Outside Screwball and like I say I do have a video you know showing it where I did get it up and and running and this is an older video before weather started coming in where you know I definitely wanted to get everything into the shop um, you know, before, you know, so I didn't have to tarp it up and keep it covered up. Now, I do have a 10-inch difference in elevation in the shop. And you can see the lip right there. I generally have to bring stuff in on, like, a pallet jack where I have it kind of high. And then I drag whatever equipment right off. And then once it's on the concrete, you know, just kind of push it around. Here I'm making an adapter uh, tool to go on the tug bar. I've already realized that, uh, you know, all pieces of machinery need accessories. And this is the first piece of accessory I made to go on the tug bar for assisting moving stuff around. I did show this tug bar on a clip or two on Instagram, but I think this is the first time I've ever showed it on YouTube. So I do plan on having a standalone video in the future of just uh, restoring this tug bar. Now you're controlling everything from the handle. It's got the long handle and when you push down, of course, that's what gives you the traction at the drive wheels. Now I moved the Regal LeBlanc out in order to put the grinder in its spot. That wall is where I had the Regal LeBlanc and I just needed more room to put, uh, I went and decided to put my grinders there. Now you've seen on the back of the grinder, the electrical uh, wires hanging there. I pulled the electrical box off because it's huge and I'm gonna chop the box down. It doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't need to be near as big as it is. And that way it'll allow me to go closer up against the wall.
to give you an idea of the weight of this, the table alone, 700 something pounds. That's a 15 inch rotary table, uh, eight inch Kirk Vice, 140 pound anvil. Anyway, if the floor wasn't really nice and smooth, I would have put beams and tied the bottom feet together. Otherwise you could break something real easily if, if one of the feet snagged. Also, this is a little older video. Um, I got it in the shop before weather came. Uh, you've probably seen some other videos on it where I've had the whole headstock apart and did repairs to it. I uh, took it to work and pressure washed it. Got 65 years of uh, crud off of it. Um, I still have the motor out of it. I still got to change the uh, bearings in the motor and uh, switch wiring on the motor from 440 to 220. Uh, but I got some clips here. I've just shown the process of getting it in to my shop. I don't think Monarch, when they designed this lathe, was figuring that it was going to go in a little home uh, hope shop under somebody's house. Uh, but as you can see here, I did have to take the cross slide uh, handle off. But what's the old saying? Clearance is clearance. Um, this is the location that the monarch uh will be that'll be its uh new home and then here you can see that's the chain come along that i uh got at the scrap yard and that'll help assist in getting the lathe right now the lathe is sitting up on some track movers with uh wooden beams because it's got to be you know like i say 10 inches above the other ground level and then now i'll just start dragging it uh off under the uh I guess I would say the upper level of the shop. But not a whole lot of room. I almost thought I was going to have to pull the taper attachment off. But I was lucky enough where I got it sucked up in there without having to do that. Here I'm just showing the anchor point. It's got a couple uh, half inch lags going down into the concrete. Uh, just for pulling off of. I think this shows a little bit better as far as the view on on the clearance those uh, like it looks will barely clear and I almost thought I was gonna have to pull the taper attachment off and these things are extremely heavy on the monarch so I was hoping I was gonna be able to snake it through there without having to remove it which which I was able to um, I did use to come along until I got it safely on the upper deck and then I switched over to the electric winch. Here I'm showing a tow lift jack that I built a few years back. And um, so far it's, I used a uh, five ton, I think, uh, ram when I built this thing. And this, it seems to handle, uh, this is the heavy, uh, heavy part of the lathe and it seems to pick it up just fine what I'm doing here is I got some uh, nylon pads that I'm setting under it you know so once I start sliding on the concrete you know it's not metal to metal and uh, the bottom of the lathe isn't digging into the concrete and then here I'm just showing both pads on both ends and now we're switching over to the, uh, the electric winch and I'm just showing if I'm splitting the cable then I'll pull off of those two top deals where if I'm just single pulling then I'll pull off at the center of that orange bracket. Now on those black nylon pads that are underneath the corners that you could see I put little pockets in the center and then the adjustable bolts that adjust the lathe went down in and they grabbed those pockets that way you know as the lathe's dragging you know I'm not losing those pads and if you've seen in one of the videos, you could see one of the pads actually rotating and spinning as the lathe's moving. Mm. 
Here I'm pulling the Monarch past my uh, old Regal LeBlanc. Um, the Monarch, weight-wise, about the same, but the LeBlanc will spin 26 inches, where the Monarch's an 18 and a half inch swing. And here's some good old-fashioned uh, labor, you know, getting it right into position. All right, here I'm showing a few things I picked up at the Barzi Bash. Uh, this year was the first time I attended the Bash, uh, 2021, and had a wonderful time. And you all know Ox Tool and Tom. Um, I'm honored to be able to call him a friend. Well, he actually brought quite a bit of stuff this year. And, of course, I was going through stuff on his table and kind of making a little pile. And to start out, here's an old Lufkin inside mic that will go up to 24 inch. And I'm like, okay, I got a, a lay that'll do 26 inches. It would be nice to be able to measure something, same capacity as the equipment I have. And here's just another brand. Uh, I forgot what that one was. I think I'm going to show it there. Yeah, sure, sure. Tomiko, Tomiko. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. I'm... I'm not one to uh, ask how to pronounce something, that's for sure. But anyway, another nice inside uh, mic. So I picked up uh, both of them. I remember Tom saying something about, what, two? Why two? And I'm like, why not two? Uh, here's a Pratt & Whitney uh, Precision Flat. I'm not sure how precision anymore. Um, you know, it just shows, shows a little bit of uh, wear, but... For the stuff I do, I'm sure it'll be absolutely just fine. And here's just some uh, Blue Point uh, filler gauges. And he had a pretty nice set of tap and dies also uh, that didn't look like they've ever been used. So, of course, I threw those on the pile. And here we have a couple uh, lifting straps that appeared to be in awesome shape. And a couple cutters going horizontal. And here's some silver solder. Tom was selling silver solder and I asked him how much. I didn't know he had it priced on the back per loop. And when he was telling me, I said, what, what do you mean per loop? I want the whole roll. I don't want per loop, I, I want the whole roll. <laughs> I do use a lot of silver solder. I don't know if I, 150 feet should last me a while. Now these, and that was just the uh, the gift the gift bag that came by attending the Barzi Bash. And there was another gentleman that was selling some carbide, and here's a couple uh, solid carbide, brand new in mills. That anybody that bought carbide knows what carbide cost. So I did pick up a couple uh, brand new ones. Okay, here's a load of stuff that I uh, picked up from the Bay Area. And there's a lot of tooling in the back of the truck. But there's also another piece of machinery that I never did get unloaded yet. That was given to me from, uh, from another friend in Southern California. This is all tooling from the Bay Area. But this is an old router table that was given to me and I haven't decided what exactly I'm going to do with it yet but I'm going to make something pretty cool out of it but here we're showing the grinder and the die filer and all the rest of the stuff you're going to see in this video it kind of a bittersweet I've been buying for four years now from an older machinist in the Bay Area that his health has been declining and it got to the point where he actually had to uh, go into some assistant living home and all of his stuff uh, be sold. And that always kind of strikes me, you know, I, I don't know, we're all going to be there um, someday. 
you know, but for somebody to not be able to do what they're definitely passionate about doing, you know, is always kind of a little bittersweet. Uh, but I'm very fortunate and blessed to be able to get all the tooling I did um, from them. There's definitely going to be a lot of tooling uh, from the rest of the video. So I'll try to, you know, I'll try to mention, you know, some of it. But a lot of it I'm just going to let you watch uh, without me uh, doing a voiceover on it. Um, here I'm just showing the adjustable uh, for the table. That just adjusts the angle and then you tighten it up. Uh, this is a carbide tool grinder. If anybody's not familiar, you know, with it, you know, you generally run diamond stones on it for grinding your... Uh, you know carbide cutters and this one here it's got the pretty fancy all electric uh, four reverse switches in the back which I'm pretty sure is all original to this grinder and I've been wanting this grinder for several years from them I just thought it was super cool uh, but it was their main grinder so they weren't gonna sell anything they were using on a daily basis here I'm kind of showing inside the shop this is all the carbide uh, just cutters and carbide inserts that they started pulling out of that cabinet right there. I ended up buying that complete cabinet. Um, but the top drawer had all their carbide stuff in it and they already pulled it out. And just a lot of miscellaneous. I was just picking stuff that I was interested in and uh, loading up and putting it on the cabinet and just making a pile. Now this drill press here, my buddy, my good friend, bought this drill press. And then you'll see a picture later where he's got it all cleaned up and it cleaned up beautiful. Now this drill press here is 1979, and I have the same drill press, but it's Bad's Jet, which I think mine is 1981, so, you know, a couple years difference. Uh, but anyway, awesome drill presses. Here I was kind of bummed because I found that chipboard and I put it up on the shelf so it wouldn't squeeze those sh two sh top shelves together. And anyway, as soon as I picked it up, the board dropped down and it kind of squished the sides in a little bit on the cabinet. But, but anyway, they, they straightened right out, so no big deal. And here we just got stuff uh, loaded up onto the trailer. Whenever I'm hauling something like this radial drill press, I always like to get blocks of wood supporting the arm all the way down to the base, you know, just so the column's not carrying the whole weight of the drill press itself. Just helps keep from messing stuff up if you hit big bumps or something. And here we're back in my driveway, just unloading uh, the two cabinets and all the tooling. Now the drill press that my friend Mike bought, I mentioned that he's already, uh, you know, been cleaning it up. Well, this is the same drill press. Uh, no paint, just some elbow grease, and just cleaned and detailed it, and it actually came out beautiful. I've always wanted an engraver like this, an electronic engraver. Uh, for years, I've always had just a little vibrator with the hardened tip, you know, that just vibrates, you know, for etching your tools. And um, I just always wanted one. I've never used one. I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not really sure. Um, I know you ground one side and you start etching. So here I am. Uh, you'll actually see. I have the ground strap on the back end of the wrench and then I'm actually holding the wrench while I'm uh, arcing you know my name in it um, normally when you plug something in the wall and it's sending out little arcs like it does about now I think is you'll see some marks coming out uh, I guess if you're not supposed to hold the whatever you're engraving it'll let you know but 
I never did get shocked or anything, so I'll have fun playing around with this one. All right, this is a two-foot height gauge, uh, Mijitoya, which I've been eyeballing for a few years now, and it's obviously an older model, um, but the price, you know, came down to where it was kind of like nuts, and um, I thought, okay, it's taken, it's worth taking a risk on it. I did plug it in, and you know, it seemed to seemed to work at the time. So here, when I got home, I just kind of clipped on a dial indicator I know there's nothing super fancy what I'm doing here but I just clipped right onto the beam you know a dial indicator that I know is you know pretty gosh darn good shape and um you know I thought well let's just see how close let's see how close it is and for the kind of work that I do I, I think it's going to be just fine Okay, this was a pretty awesome find. At one time, the shop had a Monarch 10 E lathe in the shop. And I have a Monarch 10 E lathe, but I haven't really messed around with it much yet. And I do not have a steady rest or a follow rest. And the gentleman that I was dealing with said, Hey, I think there's a bunch of Monarch stuff still in one of those cabinets. Uh, and anyway, this is the stuff that we brought out. This is a Monarch 10 E follow rest with the steady rest. The way I understand is, you know, the steady rest you can find fairly easy, but apparently the follow rest are really hard to come by. And then here we just have a D13, um, you know, for collets. And then you also had this nose cone that bolted on if you're using the collet deal. And brown and sharp radius cutters. And then the rest of the stuff on top of there is just uh, related to face, face plate and everything is all D13 that fits the 10 E Monarch. Okay, now we got a table full of stuff here. Um, here at Obvious Norton uh, Diamond Wheel. That'll go on my, I got a Cincinnati number two tool grinder. And then there's a brand new diamond wheel that'll go on the carbide grinder that I bought from them. And here we have some B blocks that can, you know, be used on the, uh, the grinder. This is a style that, you know, you can still put them right on a magnetic chuck. And there's an adapter. That's an, that's a, uh, oh gosh, what was that? Maybe a number six. Number six taper that fits the headstock. And here we have a scissor style uh, knurling tool. Now this one I'm gonna have to play around with. That's got a single wheel cutter and the gentleman I bought it from thought rather than just forming um, the knurls, it actually cut. So anyway, I'll have to do some research and play it around and exactly to see how that works. And there's a nice Starrett, like brand new calipers. That actually already was a, a, a gift. I already gifted that to Jack. And I figure if he's going to be playing around with the lathe, you know, you got to have something to measure it with. And here's just a bunch of radius gauges. And got a small pile of some oil hardening precision ground flat. And that is a number three Morse taper, big cone. And that one's another large cone. That was a number four Morse taper. 
This one is American made. I'm not sure about the other one. Now these are pretty cool. I have two of these already, but there's a little slide knocker, you know, for knocking your chucks out or, you know, into your Morse tapers. And here we have some some more chucks. Normally I only like to get um, you know the ball bearing chucks. But that's a number five center, so that'll fit my big lathe. And then these two here have number two more, so they'll fit the 10 double E. And this is a large 18 with a number four taper. So that'll fit the that'll fit my bigger monarch. And a couple tap handles. This one here, I, I think that's the first card. It's the ARD brand one that I have. Of course, I have several of uh, several of these. You know, the Greenfield. I have not used any cutters like like these. They look like you just self sharpen them, you know, and. Um, keep running until nothing's left, but I never use that style. Here we got some other gauges. Uh, these are Lufkin. And I haven't used these. I believe you just kind of stick them in the hole and whatever lines they line up with tells you uh, the diameter of the slot or hole or whatever you're happen to be measuring. I think that's that there's a Starrett and that's a Lufkin also. And there's just a, another set of uh, letter drill bits and some thread turning tools. Now this is a pretty cool sign plate. I couldn't find any markings on it but it appears to be made really well. And here's a set of stair parallels, which are always come in handy. And as you can see, they're very good shape. Here we got another Lufkin set of uh, radius gauges. And some parallels. I didn't see any markings on them. They look like they're uh, also pretty nice. I just couldn't see any markings. And there's a set of Starrett uh, B blocks. Two of them don't have the clamp. One of them's got the hold down clamp. That one right there. And here we got one of the electronic uh, edge finders and then a Starrett edge finder. And here, one of my top two favorite indicators. I really like Federal and Ames indicators. Although this Starrett one is very nice. It's a tenth indicator, meaning each line is a tenth of one thousandth. And it runs really nice and smooth. And this is a little uh, toolmaker square, which is in really nice shape. I kind of glanced around on a uh, eBay and I couldn't believe how much they wanted for for this set. And this one's awesome shape as far as cosmetic, but it's a little stuck, so I gotta pull the back off and check it out. And 
and that's a geometric threading tool which goes in your tailstock. Well, most of the time I run them in the tailstock, and you can set where you want it to trip off. You know, to where as soon as it threads the depth you want, it automatically opens up the the jaws, and you back it out and go again. Uh, here's just a set of some soft jaws with the magnets on them that just kind of clip on. And then we got a tool here that you can set on a piece of pipe or any kind of round radius, and you can set your degree that you want to put your little transfer mark, and then you just kind of tap it, you know, just like a transfer punch. This, that was kind of thrown in. I didn't even know that I that got in a pile. But anyway, this is another very nice indicator. Swiss made, uh, Badge Lufkin. And another little Lufkin square. That was a really nice quality square too. I forgot where that one was made. And another Lufkin. And another radius gauge. This is old brown and sharp. All right, here's another cute little tap handle. Here's my little rack I made for my tap handles, and apparently I need to make another rack. It's, I thought I had the smallest one of the Greenfield, but apparently I don't. I do now. Now these are pretty cool, Swiss made too, but I was trying to uh, get my new phone to focus and it wasn't doing a very good job. But anyway, these are just little scribes, you know, just click in and out. Not as cool as a Randy Richard scribe, but they'll work in a pinch. And these are just your typical one, two, three blocks. And your typical call, call it closers. Most of the time the sets come either square or hex. Now I originally thought this was a cheaper import until I got home and I realized, hey, wait a second, that's, <laughs> that's a really nice quality one. Just a spin indexer. And this one, I think, is really cool. I want to do some research on this one. It also takes 5C collets, but it's made by the Poly Choke Company, which I'm assuming is the same company that makes the Poly Chokes for shotgun barrels. And in here we got a, another Sterrett little clamp-on vise that clamps to the edge of your table. Okay, here's the two uh, Vidmar cabinets that I also bought, and then they're pretty full. I already sorted through a lot of the tooling I bought. I learned a long time ago, rather than sorting through drawers of tooling, you know, just buy the whole darn drawer worth. <clears throat> now all this stuff is already in this top drawer, but a lot of the tooling that you'll see on the drawers under this uh, were in other cabinets. Um, that they just pulled the drawer out. We just set the drawer right on the pallet, came up with a price, and 
called it good. You know, I, I learned a long time ago, pick out a few items, and I'm going to pay just as much as just buying the whole darn drawer. Okay, I'm a huge fan of carbide, and this entire drawer here is all carbide. For an example, let's see, I'm picking up just that drill bit, just one solid car carbide drill bit. You know what? You know what it costs if you've ever had to buy carbide. That's a brace tip. There's a few in there that just have a uh, brace tip carbide on the end, but the majority of all those end molds. Actually, just about everything in there is uh, solid carbide in mills. Okay, this drawer is all high-speed end mill. Um, originally, I wasn't even going to look at it about getting it until I started going through it. It appears to be all brand new stuff. It was their cream of the crop, so I, of course I bought the whole drawer of it also. Then we get into this drawer. Here on the left is all boring tools. A lot just high speed and a lot of it with the uh, carbide braced and on them And this next area is just uh, full of uh, radius cutters. And here we got a whole bunch of woodruff uh, key seat cutters. There's a few other dovetail cutters in there, but most of them are uh, the woodruff cutters for cutting keyways. All right, here we got a whole bunch of small reams. I forgot what size the reams go up to. And then we get over here to where we have some counter bores. You know, and if you use very many Allen head bolts, you know, you use those if you want to countersink them where they're uh, flush. That's where you use these cutters. Here I'm uh, holding the phone with my hand, doing the best job I can of covering the lens with my fingers. But that brings us to some small long drill bits. 
bolts are always very handy. And then we got some real small drill bit uh, cards here. If you gotta use ones that small, you're uh, the only time I go that small is if I'm uh, drilling out a torch tip. And here we got a whole bunch of uh, extended length center drills, which come in handy from time to time. And a bunch of easy outs. Not my favorite style easy out, but they were in the drawer with some of the other stuff. Now this, I'll be honest, I'm not totally sure what they are. They're pilots. And I'm thinking that at one time they did have an engraving machine for doing engraving there. I, I don't know if these were for it. Um, I'll have to do a little checking and uh, find out. But they definitely have a bunch of them. Here we just got a few little miscellaneous things in the corner and then uh, dividers for the drawers, which are always nice to have. And then just some miscellaneous stuff, some little wire brushes. Not sure, uh, don't think I'll need them to use them too often, but I got plenty of them. Earlier in the video, I showed all the carbide on the pallet down on the ground. And I tried to sort through a lot of it and put the carbide back in the drawer, but I got a lot of sorting to do. You know, just sorting it out and getting it where I could find it. Most of all that is all brand new, but there is some used stuff mixed in it. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it I won't, you know, you can identify the size, but sometimes the type of carbide it is is a little little trickier to do but anyway lots of carbide Here's another random drawer with a lot of high-speed steel in it and a lot more uh, carbide inserts. And this drawer's got a whole bunch of boring bars. All that was already in there, so I'm not really sure what's all up underneath there. But it looks like it's got some nice boring bars in it. Here's a whole bunch of different fly cutters. I don't think I'll ever have to buy another fly cutter as long as I live.
And that brings us to the carbide insert tool holders that most of that carbide hopefully fits. And there's a box of expanded reamers. And if you've made it this far into the video, there should be an award just for you uh, making it to a 50 minute video. But if you haven't seen my latest video, I recommend you go check it out. Um, I gave a deadline of Christmas, but I will extend that a little bit. So like I say, if you're one of my subscribers, I'm having a giveaway. Uh, so check out my last video. And again, I really appreciate all my subscribers. I appreciate my new subscribers. I appreciate comments and thumbs up. And if you're not a subscriber, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And until next year, thanks for watching.